Just before we get into the video, I have a very, very special announcement that I think you guys are gonna like. My team and I have been cooking up something really special for you guys. A lot of you in the comments talk about your own experiences trying out the Nuzlocks that we do, and I find that incredible. So we did something wild. With every new run we do, we will be releasing a full-fledged guidebook that we create. These guidebooks will include all the type-specific encounters, all the best items, TMs, strategies for all the major battles in every specific run, and much more. From here on out, all channel members will receive every single guidebook each week free of charge in addition to the other perks like early video access, exclusive Silk Squad emotes and Kingdra badges beside your name in the comments, sneak peek member community posts, and many more. In the coming days, you can also look out for these guidebooks available for 5 bucks in the merch shelf beneath our videos, but if you enjoy the videos and want to support what I do and get all the guidebooks and other perks each week, make sure to click that join button beneath the video and I'll see you on the other side. Welcome everyone, my name's Sylf, and this is my attempt to beat a hardcore Nuzlocke of Pokemon Platinum with only Ghost-type Pokemon. The full rule set for this run is listed down below, but put simply, only the first Ghost-type encounter in each route or area can be caught. If a Pokemon faints, it must be permanently boxed. No items except held items in battle. Party Pokemon levels are limited to the next Gym Leader or Elite Four's Ace, and finally, the battle mode must be put on set at all times. The Ghost type is perhaps one of the most interesting types in the entire Pokemon franchise. From having only one evolution line in the first generation to having some strange type interactions, this type has often been among the top favorites among Pokemon fans since its inception. Although it's often quite a rare type in the games, Pokemon Platinum does do them some justice, to the point where you can even consider doing a monotype hardcore Nuzlocke of it at least. In total, the eight fully evolved Pokemon on screen are available within the fourth generation. However, for the purposes of our run in Platinum, we have some limitations. First, since our rules prohibit catching legendaries, Giratina will be unavailable. And damn is that ever a tough loss. Secondly, the Mischievous and Miss Magius line is exclusive to Pokemon Pearl, unfortunately. Finally, since our rules don't allow us to connect to other games, we can do trade evolutions, meaning we'll be stuck with Dusclops instead of Dust Noir. But so, if you might say, Gengar is a trade evolution too. And yes, that's true, although technically there is a way to get Gengar without trade evolving, but it's a tricky situation. We'll cross that bridge when we come to it. Before we set off on our journey, we've got to say hi to our mom, who everyone in the fandom is always thirsting over for some reason. I really, really don't get the appeal. I mean, she's just a bunch of pixels. There's nothing that just conspicuously points out at me about her. I mean, okay, come on guys, that's just the shape of her apron. For our starter Pokemon, I'm going to choose Piplup. All of the starters are neutral against our typing, so it doesn't really matter what Barry chooses, although Chimchar does get the fighting type, which we're immune to, so I figured I'd give him some leeway with him getting Turtwig. Shortly afterwards, our mom scolds us about having gone out to the wild without a wild Pokemon, and goodness gracious. Okay, I get it. Now here we run into a bit of a problem. The first available ghost type in the game isn't available until after the first gym at the Valley Windworks. We have two options. We could just absolutely run through the Orberg gym with a super effective Piplup, at which point the run would officially begin, or we could make things harder. You guys know me by now, we're doing the latter. To see if this run would be theoretically possible if we could get our first encounter before the first gym, I used the Universal Pokemon Randomizer to add in a Drifloon named Simulation. With that, let's see what we can do against the Orberg Gym. Now Drifloon is part flying type after all, so it is weak to rock, and its only attacks at this point are Gust, which rock types resist, and the super weak 30 power Astonish, which is a physical move. Terrible for high defense Pokemon. Thankfully, the first trainer's Geodude only seemed to have normal offensive moves, although it was very slow to take down. The second trainer had a Geodude with the same situation, and then he sends out an Onix. His Onix does have Rock Throw, but Onix's attack is fairly low, and so is his special defense, so we're able to barely outdo it over time. This is not looking good for Rourke. After getting to high level 14, it's time for one of the most ridiculous looking battles we have ever had. Three powerful rock Pokemon, our best move is resisted by all of them, and we are weak to all three of them too. I'm not gonna beat around the bush. Our only chance in hell was to try and set up Minimize, which Drifloon has by default. This was my 12th attempt at this battle, and the one kind of creative thing I learned to do was actually ensure that Piplup was in our party. It can't be sent into battle as per our rules, of course. What this does is encourages Geodude to use Stealth Rock during one of its first two turns, since there's actually a Pokemon that it would affect on our party were we to switch, which Rourke doesn't use if you're going solo. 
This allows us a free turn for another minimize, and so long as Geodude misses its first rock throw, your odds of surviving sort of increase from there as you increase your evasion more and more. The good thing is, rock throw is only 90% accuracy, so that helps a bit too. On this attempt, we got to max evasion, then used focus energy, which we just learned at level 14. This raises our critical hit ratio, which we absolutely need since Gust is our best bet since it's a special move, even though it's resisted. Unfortunately, due to a potion used by Rourke, he's able to hit us with a rock throw while in the red, which brings us to nearly half before we can take him out. Holy. From there, we can level up to level 15, which is allowed in Hardcore Nuzlocke, so you just have to be at or below the level cap as the battle begins, and he sends out Kranidos. Now here, I figured since Kranidos' defense is nowhere near as high as Geodude's, I can use Astonish since not only are we at max evasion, but Astonish adds to that with the flinch chance too. We hit him twice before he breaks through all of that and hits us with super effective pursuit, and we live on just 3 HP. Holy sh**. After he uses a potion, thankfully we make it through safely to take him down. Now we have an entire Onyx to take down with just 3 HP. Thankfully, a critical hit after our focus energy helps us to take him down in 3 gusts. Unbelievable. We beat Rourke with nothing but a level cap Drifloon. At least we know it's possible if this encounter was available. Get me out of here. Shortly thereafter, we make it to Floroma Town, then we travel east to the Valley Windworks. Once we take care of Team Galactic here, the faded balloon Pokemon finally returns, much to the delight of this little girl and me too. On Fridays only, Drifloon appears here as a static encounter, and since we want to play this as legit as possible, we're going to catch this one as our official first encounter. We successfully catch it and nickname it Zeppelin. Zeppelin ends up having a gentle nature, which is plus special defense and minus defense. Not ideal, but not terrible either, I suppose. It also has the Unburden ability, which raises its speed if its held item disappears, which is perfect for something like a berry and might come in handy. With that, we can deposit our fake Drifloon and Piplup and officially start the adventure. Once we arrive in Eterna Forest, we're encountered by Cheryl, who's afraid to go through the forest alone and wants to come along with us. Why didn't you just ask that f guy right over there the whole time you were in here? Wait, what? No, I didn't! After dumping her off, we can have a much easier time finding our next encounter, which is a 4% chance to find in this forest. Ghastly. We catch one and nickname it Reaper, and Reaper has a naughty nature, plus attack, and minus special defense. Ew. Not so great for a special attacker. After reaching Eterna City, I'm having a great old time meeting with the locals until this kid. You can't catch me. I set some traps. Oh, everybody run! Having saved our own life at the expense of the three other people on that floor, I decide to pick up the experience share from one of Rowan's assistants since we've met the 35 Pokemon scene requirement, which will help with leveling up Reaper. Now, we did get the Cut HM from Cynthia, but I forgot that we need the next badge in order to use it outside of battle, meaning we're blocked off from our next encounter, so it's time for the Eternity Gym. Now, this gym, unlike Orberg's, I'm feeling pretty confident about since it's a grass-type gym, and we have two Pokemon that resist grass after all. After defeating the gym trainers, Ghastly is nearly level- Wait a minute. It's time for our second gym leader battle, this time against the Grass-type Eterna Gym's Gardenia. She sends out a Turtwig, and I lead with Reaper. I decide to hit it with Confused Ray right away, and it hurts itself in confusion. I then use Nightshade to bring it below half, and it hits us with Razor Leaf and crits us below half, but our Orenberry helps out, and another Nightshade does the job. She sends in Cherim next, and I go with the same strategy, and it hurts itself on the first turn. Nightshade does right about half on it, and then it gets off a Leech Seed. Now this is why I led with Reaper right here. I know we need Zeppelin for later, and we couldn't switch Reaper in safely if Zeppelin got Leech Seeded. Due to the Leech Seed recovery, Cherim doesn't get KO'd by another Nightshade, but thankfully it just used Safeguard in the meantime. Now here, since Cherim is confused and Reaper has been Leech Seeded, I decide now's the time to try to switch in Zeppelin safely before her Ace comes in. On the switch, Cherim hits us with Magical Leaf, which does hardly anything, and a super effective Stab Gust takes her down. In comes Roserade, and since we resist all of her moves, I know the most that it can do is paralyze us with Stun Spore, but she misses it right off the bat. In the end, we handled her pretty well despite the Citrus Berry and Potion that she used, and it took about 7 Gusts to do the trick after we were paralyzed and brought to about a third after our Orenberry. Our team got surprisingly hurt during that battle considering we resisted every move she had, but we got the job done. With our second badge in hand, we can now use Cut to access the Old Chateau, a distinct area that's located to the north of Eterna Forest. Not only is this place great for training up special attack EVs, but it also gives us a new encounter. 
In one of the rooms, the TV is flickering, and if approached at nighttime, none other than a Rotom will emerge. Thank God for Platinum, as in Diamond and Pearl, you have to wait until the post-game to catch it. Now, interestingly enough, having this as our old Chateau encounter will actually cut off any hope of getting Gengar. Our rules don't allow trade evolutions first after all, and the only other way to get Gengar is kinda strange. You have to have a Game Boy Advance game inserted into your DS to activate wild Gengar encounters in here. That technically would also break our no connecting to other games to get Pokemon rule, but even still, as good as Gengar is, I'd prefer to have an additional encounter anyway, so Rotom it is. We catch it and nickname it Phantom. See what I did there? And it has a relaxed nature, plus defense, and minus speed. Certainly not great, but hey. A good Pokemon overall, and electric coverage is great. On the top floor of the Galactic Building in Eterna, we encounter Commander Jupiter, who challenges us to battle. She leads with a Zubat, so I try out our newly obtained Rotom. Rotom has Shockwave, which is 60 base power and can't miss, and it actually takes out Zubat in one hit. Nice. Gun Tank comes in next, and this thing is terrifying for us. It has super effective Stab Night Slash with a high critical hit ratio. That thing crits anything we have, and we are done for. I go for Confuse Ray right away, and it hits itself in Confusion, and then our Shockwave does over half. Phantom's pretty powerful. However, Skuntank immediately breaks out of Confusion, but thankfully just goes for Poison Gas to poison us. Whew. Because our first Shockwave did about half, it has a chance not to KO, so I decide to Confuse it again and it hits itself, but now its Citrus Berry activates. Our next Shockwave brings it to less than a quarter, but then it breaks out of Confusion again, uses Night Slash, we survive on just 4 HP, then our Orinberry activates to save us from a Poison KO and we can take it out with another attack. Damn, that was close. For saving the universe, Cynthia forcibly gives us a Togepi egg, which we graciously accept. Alright, f*** your egg. We've been streaming a normal only run in Pearl live on Twitch recently, and if we had this Togepi, we might have stood a chance so far, but no. Platinum only. Now in Heart Home, I'm realizing we're absolutely screwed against the ghost gym in this town, and I had a solution. On Route 208, there was a creepy karate man who gave us what might be the key to our success during this run, the odd keystone. Having a Spiritomb with its part dark typing would be perfect. But the Hollow Tower is just on the other side of this gate in Heart Home City and it's blocked off until we beat the gym. Great. So close yet so far. Funnily enough, we actually do have to utilize Amity Square in this challenge, and we run into this guy who says, I'm appalled. They refused entry to my Pokemon. Oh, my poor Gyarados and Steelix. This is discrimination. Alright, it's not too often you get a genuinely funny moment in the Pokemon games, but this is up there. In Amity Square, we get a few useful items, including the spooky plate to boost the power of our ghost moves. This place is actually more complex in terms of design than I remembered. Pretty cool revisiting places after like 14 years. Jesus, has it really been that long? It's time for what I fear the most, and yes, it's because they're ghosts, the Hard Home Gym. The trainers in the gym end up being pretty manageable since we can outspeed most of them with super effective moves, but that's not going to be the case with the gym leader, Fantina. Thankfully, along the way, Reaper evolves into a Haunter right before the level cap and learns Shadow Punch, which should definitely be helpful. I was initially going to wait until it learned Shadow Ball at level 29, but nah. I spent a long time thinking about how we could approach this battle, and every scenario I played out in my head was not working. Even a berry, unburdened speed boost strat wouldn't work as payback only does double damage if you get outsped. The problem here is Miss Magius, a super fast and super strong Pokemon with stab super effective Shadow Ball against our entire team. It can one hit KO every single thing that we have. After like an hour of theory crafting, a plan came to mind. Let's test it out. I put the Dread Plate on Drifloon to power up its payback move, the Shell Bell on Rotom, and the Spooky Plate on Haunter. Fantina starts with Duskull, and I lead with Reaper. Remembering from our last Platinum Challenge, Duskull tends to use Will-O-Wisp or Future Sight first, so I came up with a plan. We got the Substitute TM from the old Chateau, which I taught to Reaper. I use Substitute, and Duskull indeed goes for Future Sight. Not as good as the Burn Attempt, but I'll take it. From here, I can use Spooky Plate Boosted Shadow Punch to one-hit KO it. Now I knew no matter what she sends out next, we'd be alright so long as we have the sub up since Haunter has super low defense and would get taken down in one hit, but she goes for Miss Magius. I had trained up Reaper a lot in speed in preparation for this battle, so I was really hoping we could outspeed her, especially just having leveled up, and we do. But Shadow Punch just barely doesn't KO. She then hits us with Shadow Ball, and the substitute protects us, then we get hit by the future side attack, but we can just use Shadow Punch again to take her down. Incredible. 
I think that was the only possible way to do that. In comes her Haunter last, and Shadowclaw would do huge damage and outspeed anything else on our team, so I have to go for Shadow Punch here, and due to its low defense, it KOs in one hit. Substitute and our speedy Vs absolutely saved our asses here. Three badges down. Barry battles us as we try to leave the city, and despite his Staravia's attempts to double team, we have Rotom with Shockwave, which can't miss, which takes it down in one hit, as well as his Buizel after it. Drifloon is able to handle his Grottle with Stab Super Effective Gust, and his Ponyta is taken down with a combination of Zeppelin and Phantom, with only Zeppelin being brought to low health at just 16 HP and with a burn too. After the battle, this girl says, There's a wrecked stone pillar up ahead. I wonder what it is. It's got me very curious. Me too, baby, me too. Let's go check it out. With that, we now have access to the Hallowed Tower on Route 209. Now to get Spirit Tomb, you have to talk to 32 real players in the underground, but you can just talk to the same one over and over again via wireless, so it's tedious but not impossible. We catch Spirit Tomb and nickname it Dante, and it has a relaxed nature plus defense and minus speed. Finally, a reasonable nature for us. Immediately following this, we can get access to our fifth encounter in the Lost Tower, pretty much right beside the Hallowed Tower. In here, there are Wild Duskull with a 20% rate. We catch one successfully and nickname it Wazowski. The name will make a bit more sense once it evolves. And it has a hardy nature, which is neutral. I love me some neutral natures. Once we arrive in Veilstone, we can head right for the gym, a fighting type gym. The trainers are quite manageable with Zeppelin's gust and immunity to fighting, of course, and eventually she evolves into a beautiful Drift Blim right at level 30, which I had delayed so we could get Ominous Wind early. Before progressing to gym leader Maylene, I decide to hit up the Veilstone department store to pick up the Reflect TM, which I teach to Phantom. Uh... On the fifth floor, this guy says, Two buff guys standing side by side. That's all. What? What's the problem? I... Uh... Nothing. It's... We're in public, guys. With that excessive PDA fresh on my mind, it's time to challenge for our fourth gym badge. Now on the face of it, Drift Blim seems like a shoe in for this battle, however both Maylene's Machoke and Metatite have super effective Rock Tomb with the speed drop, so I decide to send in Phantom against her Metatite. I use Reflect right away and Metatite hits us with Rock Tomb and lowers our speed. I then hit it with Stab Super Effective Ominous Wind for the one hit KO. Her Machoke comes in next and I go for Ominous Wind hoping for the Omni Boost and it does less than half. Her Machoke then goes for Focus Energy and another hit takes it to the red, after which we get hit by Rock Tomb, it crits us and lowers our speed further, then it outspeeds us due to the drop and crits us again before we can take it out. Yikes. The Reflect was almost pointless there. In comes her ace, Lucario, and I know I need to get the Reflect back up so I stay in and risk the crit, but it doesn't, we survive on 13 HP and can get it up. I switch into Zeppelin here, and Metal Claw gets a crit. Are you kidding me? What in the world is happening? I stay in on the next turn, knowing we can survive a non-crit at least, since I know we need the damage from Gust. I then switch into Reaper, and Lucario misses its Metal Claw on the switch, but then outspeeds us and hits us with one before I can confuse it with Confuse Ray. Reflect goes down now, but it hits itself in Confusion, so Shadow Punch can bring it below half. It hits itself again, thankfully, and another attack brings it to a sliver. Knowing Show Potion now, I take the opportunity to switch into Dante. Dante is a great switch in since Metal Claw is the only move she can hit us with and our pressure ability starts draining its power points quickly. Our next ominous wind attack takes it down. That got quite scary with all those crits, but Dante definitely pulled through for us. While traveling to Pistoria City, Reaper ends up learning Shadow Ball so we can finally stop using a physical move on a Haunter. Duskull also ends up evolving into a Dusclops, which should add some good bulk and a physical attacking presence to our team, along with the Shadow Punch move. Right before we get to the Pastoria Gym, Barry challenges us to battle, a battle you should always watch out for in Platinum as it can be quite a surprise. But we can pull off a similar strategy to last time since his team hasn't developed in terms of evolutions like ours has. After the battle, Barry says, Oh yeah, I joined Mr. Wake as an apprentice. Like, I want my own theme song. F***ing kill me. It's time for the Water-type Pastoria Gym. Phantom makes quite easy work of most of the gym, as might be expected, although at one point a Gyarados almost killed Zeppelin, as I realized just in time Phantom was going to overlevel, so I had to switch, and we survived on just 2 HP. Sheesh. It's time for the fifth gym leader, Wake. I thought about buying the Thunderbolt TM from the game corner for Phantom for this battle, but it's far too expensive, and we can get Surf soon too to get the TM elsewhere anyway. Wake leads with a Gyarados, and I lead with Phantom, and decide to set up the Reflect right away. After getting hit by Waterfall, I use Shockwave, which instantly KOs Gyarados since it's stab and four times effective. 
He next sends out Floso, which is a bit less of a concern with Reflect up now, and Crunch brings us to about half. Shockwave then hits it to the red, and its Citrus Berry activates, and our Shell Bell helps us a bit as Crunch brings us to just 28 HP and lowers our defense, but we can take it out with another attack. Quagsire is his final Pokemon, and knowing we're too low health, I switch into Dante, and we get Yawn before hitting an Ominous Wind. I then switch into Wazowski, and he goes for Yawn again. Interesting. Figuring he might just keep spamming it, I go for Shadow Punch, and he did indeed go for Yawn again. What a weird dude. From here, since Wazowski's quite bulky, it's just a waiting game, and funnily enough, our Quick Claw even activated as we were asleep one time. Eventually, we wake up and take the damn thing out with a crit Shadow Punch. Five badges. Now just outside Pastoria on Route 212, there's a move tutor who teaches moves to Pokemon in exchange for shards. After getting the necessary shards from the Great Marsh and the Underground, I decide to have him teach Wazowski Fire Punch, as it provides great coverage that is much needed on our team for Steel types who otherwise resist almost everything we have. Back in Pastoria, Team Galactic is... Oh, Barry, would you stop f***ing around? Somebody's trying to bomb the city. After violently macing the Psyduck on Route 210, we head north towards Celestic Town. Along the way, Dante ends up learning Nasty Plot, which is a fantastic move for such a bulky Pokemon that also has offensive capabilities. Upon arriving in Celestic Town, we can pick up a great item since it's the morning. This guy here gives us none other than the Choice Specs item, which should be a great help with our special attackers. Alright, I know you guys yelled at me last time for this, but I need to confess something. I can't stop dating Cynthia's grandma. We're still together. She says, This old charm is something made in Celestic Town long, long ago. Since you're in Celestic Town, why not look around inside the ruins? Oh, you know it. Okay, I'm sorry. I'm so too far. Just too far. Cyrus tries to intervene in our date again, so we have to teach him a lesson, and it goes relatively smoothly as Wazowski can now handle Sneasel with Fire Punch. Murkrow is handled by Dante, who can tank his attacks for a while before we switch into Phantom, who can then take it out with Shockwave, and his Golbat is handled by Shockwaves too, despite us being brought to 18 HP. On our way out, Cynthia herself appears, and I'm like, oh my god, she totally knows I'm dating her grandma. Then she says, were the ruins fun to explore? Uh, yes. Yes, they were. Traveling back, we can pick up a few upgrades for our team, including the Shadow Ball TM on Route 210, and now that we have Surf, we can also go above the Valley Windworks to pick up the Thunderbolt TM, which we teach to Phantom right away for some extra power. Once we arrive in Candlelave City, we have another rival battle against Barry, and this time he's powered up quite a lot with new evolutions and new team members. I lead with Phantom against his now Staraptor, and I went for Reflect to start, but this time we don't have Shockwave, so we do miss our Thunderbolt after he double teams, but eventually we hit one and take it down in one hit. He sends in Torterra next, and I switch into Wazowski, and Bite doesn't do much, but then our Reflect wears out. He then hits us with Razor Leaf, then we miss our Will-O-Wisp, and he hits us down to just 15 HP with Bite, but then we can hit one to burn him. I'm forced to switch here, so I go into Phantom, and now that he's burned, he goes for Mega Drain instead, which doesn't do a whole lot. I can then set up another Reflect, and combined with the burn, that means he won't be doing any physical damage on us, so he goes for Leech Seed. This gives me an opportunity to switch into Zeppelin, who can take him down with Fly since we taught her the HM for it for more power. In comes Floatzel next, and I know I want to keep Zeppelin in for the Heracross, which is a big threat, so I go for Ominous Wind to try and get the boost, but we don't get it, and Reflect goes down, and his second Pursuit brings us to half. Switching definitely would have been a bad idea anyway with Pursuit. Another attack takes him down, and he does indeed send out Heracross with Night Slash next, but thankfully we outspeed and can take him down with Stab 4 times effective Fly. Rapidash is his last Pokemon, and the only move it has that affects us is Fire Spin, which is quite weak, so we can take him down with relative ease. Barry's definitely gotten tougher, but I feel we had a good strat there. Before the Candlelight Gym, I decide to traverse through the Iron Island for some training, and thankfully this time we don't have to worry about exploding Gravelers with all of our ghost types. Along the way, we pick up the Magnet item, which should be helpful for Phantom for sure. With that, it's time for the Steel-type Candlelight City Gym. Now, all of the Steel types in this gym resist our Stab Ghost moves, so honestly, I just had to fight a war of attrition against them with Fire Punch, Confuse Ray, Reflect, Will-O-Wisp, whatever I could do. Eventually, we reach the 6th gym leader, Byron, who I'm fairly worried about. Focus Blast with a wide lens from the game corner would have been incredible here, however, unfortunately, only Gengar can learn it and not Haunter. Instead, I lead with Wazowski against his Magneton and hit him with three Fire Punches after he brings us to 18 HP with Thunderbolt since he healed up once. Our third Fire Punch brought him to just a sliver, but thankfully we do have priority Shadow Sneak so we can outspeed and take him out. Solid. 
Bastia Dawn comes out next, and I switch into Dante here. All he can do against ghost types is Stone Edge or Metal Burst, and our pressure ability will get rid of Stone Edge power points quickly anyway, so I'm able to slowly wear him down over time with attacks from Dante, Zeppelin, and Reaper. Although it was quite a long process as he kept using Taunt as I tried to nasty plot since he resists all of our moves and stockpile to raise Zeppelin's defenses, and he also full restored at 1.2. It took 8.5 minutes to take that damn thing down. His final Pokemon is Steelix, which is handled quite well by a couple of Reaper's Choice Specs boosted Shadow Balls. At this point, I'm starting to get those ideas in my head about a Deathless run. You guys know I've wanted to achieve one of those for a while, so we'll see what happens. Before moving on, I remember to pick up the hidden Dawnstone west of Pastoria City, which will be very helpful for later. At the lakes, we're forced to battle the commanders, and with Saturn, I accidentally looked up his Diamond and Pearl team and thought he led with Kadabra, so that caused some problems, but Dante's part dark typing definitely helped pull us through against Toxicroak. Mars was for once a relatively easy battle as her Perugly can't use Fake Out or Slash on us at all. On our way to Snowpoint City, we had an item Bonanza as we picked up the Light Clay from Mount Coronet, along with the Never Melt Ice 2 and the Spell Tag from Route 217. Upon arriving in Snowpoint City, I'd love for us to admire the winter scenery and all, but I have some business to take care of with the girl who could have traded us Gengar but decided to attach an Everstone on the traded Haunter. Now the Snowpoint Gym is always a scary one, but I figured since we have a neutral type, it might go alright. Our very first trainer battle ended up being insane because I didn't realize that this Glalie would have Crunch on it and it got a crit on Phantom to bring it to just 2 HP. Man oh man. During the process, Zeppelin learned Shadow Ball, and I had a heck of a time debating between it and Ominous Wind with the Omni Boost, but I figured the extra power was more reliable. It's time for our seventh gym battle against the Ice type gym leader, Candice. Candice d okay, never mind. She leads with Sneasel, and I lead with Phantom with the Light Clay item to extend the duration of our Reflect since I think we'll need it, although Sneasel outsped and hit us hard with Faint Attack beforehand. Thankfully, Reflect helps us to survive the second on just 7 HP, and I can hit it hard with Thunderbolt. Leading with a Sneasel is a disaster for us. I switch into Wazowski here, and thankfully she just went for Ice Shard to try and pick off Phantom so we can tank the following Faint Attack and take her out with Fire Punch. We've safely gotten our only Fire move on the field, and now she sends in Frostlass. Shadow Punch is the better option here, and thankfully it also can't miss, so Frostlass's double team doesn't do anything, and it gets one hit KO'd with a crit. Finally, we get some crit luck. In comes a Bomb of Snow next, which starts the hail, but 4 times super effective Fire Punch does huge damage, then it hits us with Avalanche before Candace uses a full restore, and then we can take it down with another, followed by a priority Shadow Sneak for good measure. In comes Pilus Wine, and I switch into Dante, who gets hit hard by Earthquake before we can use Hypnosis to put it to sleep, then I can safely switch into Reaper, knowing it will likely go for Earthquake even if it wakes up, and it stays asleep so two Shadow Balls do the job. That was a solid battle, and thank god we had Fire Punch on Wazowski. On the way back to the Veilstone Galactic HQ, we find the Reaper Cloth. Great. If only we could use this damn thing. In the headquarters itself, we find the Sludge Bomb TM, a fantastic stab move for Reaper. Ahem. <laughs> I farted. After taking a break, I picked up the game to play again at night so we could find our last encounter on Route 217, and while trying to find it with a 20% chance, I thought the first Snowfer I found was shiny since I wasn't used to the night animation. Then, a few encounters later, it actually happened. Shiny Snowfer. Tell me why I find more shinies in full odds 1 in 8192 Nuzlocks than actually shiny hunting 1 in 500 in Sword and Shield. After that excitement, we find our actual encounter, a female snow run, which we catch and nickname Hathina. Hathina ends up having a careful nature, plus special defense, and minus special attack. Are you kidding me? What is with our nature luck? Or lack thereof. Now that we have Rock Climb, we can get the Ice Beam TM on Route 216, which should be amazing despite our minus special attack. Now what really sucks about the Spear Pillar events is that you have to have a Rock Climb Pokemon to make it up, yet none of our Ghost Types can learn it, so I have to take a B Barrel to the peak against some of the hardest battles in the game. Oh. The double battle with Jupiter and Mars goes as well as it could thanks to Light Clay Reflect and Spiritomb's typing helping with Skuntank, and incredibly we got Mean Look towards the end, but just in the nick of time, Barry's Staraptor took down the Golbat that Mean looked us, we got crit down to like 1 HP by Air Cutter, but thankfully I could now switch and get out of there. Way too close for comfort. After grinding in Mount Coronet for Cyrus, it's time for the most terrifying battle I can think of for our team. 
I theorycrafted for a solid two hours for this fight, thinking of every possibility, and finally I came up with the only strategy I could think of that might be a teensy bit viable. And it all came down to one TM that could save us. Here it goes. Cyrus starts with a Houndoom, a ridiculous threat for us since we have nothing super effective against it, it's fast, and of course it has stabbed super effective Dark Pulse. I lead with Zeppelin and decide to try using Stockpile as much as possible to raise our defenses. We do outspeed, which is surprising but good, and he hits us with Will-O-Wisp on the first turn. We get another Stockpile off and he uses Dark Pulse to bring us to half after the burn, but our Orenberry activates, which I thought we might need to outspeed with Unburden, funnily enough. Our third stockpile goes off successfully in which our raised defenses we now survive Dark Pulse and the burn with 31 HP remaining and I use Baton Pass to pass the boost to Spiritomb, our only Pokemon not weak to either Flamethrower or Dark Pulse. He hits us with Flamethrower twice in a row and then we can use Nasty Plot to raise our special attack, then he misses a Will-O-Wisp and we can use two more after getting burned on the next turn. Now here is where the plan comes into play. He hits us with Flamethrower, and I go for Silver Wind, which just barely doesn't KO. This is to trigger him using a full restore, and I use our newly taught Rest TM to hear up Spiritomb entirely, now with huge defenses and special attack. The Houndoom then goes down in two hits. In comes Honchkrow, a big threat for our team, other than Phantom, who we couldn't have switched in safely, but Silver Wind now one hit KOs it. Weavile is next, the biggest possible threat to our team, and it uses Ice Punch, which hardly touches us, and Super Effective Silver Wind takes it down immediately. Unreal. Gyarados is next, and Dark Pulse is a one-hit KO after he waterfalls us to half. His last Pokemon is Crobat, and it doesn't survive Stab, Max Special Attack, Dark Pulse either, despite hitting us with Toxic. Incredible. I sincerely think that was the only way to win that battle, and it definitely wasn't a surefire way either. It's time for Giratina, and damn, do I ever want to catch this thing. It's allowed, right? It's it's a ghost type? Our final gym is in Sunny Shore City, the electric gym led by Volkaner. Now this battle is a strange one for us, as the matchup is kind of weird, and I'm not quite sure what to think of it. I lead with Spiritomb for some neutral bulkiness, and he leads Jolteon. I decide to go for Nasty Plot right away, but immediately remember that Charge Beam has a chance to raise his special attack, and how dangerous that could be and it did indeed get the boost on the second attack. Uh-oh. He then uses Thunder Wave to paralyze us, but we make it through with Dark Pulse. That was scary. In comes Raichu next, and it also has Charge Beam, but we can KO it with Powered Up Dark Pulse. Next up is Electivire, and this thing is a big threat. He hits us with Thunder Punch to just 6 HP, but we got the rest off, thank god. But from here, we're kind of stuck. Rest lasts for two turns, but his Thunder Punch is doing too much, and he outspeeds. I'm forced to switch into Phantom, who resists Thunder Punch, and then use Confuse Ray. He hits us with Fire Punch, which does too much for us to stay in, but I use Reflect so that we can, and he breaks through Confusion as we survive on 21 HP. I switch into Reaper here, knowing we need some raw choice specs power, and Electivire finally hurts himself in Confusion, and now we can hit him with Sludge Bomb, which KOs him. His last Pokemon is Luxray, and it just barely survives a Sludge Bomb, hits us with Crunch, and we barely survive it as well. Knowing we either outspeed or he heals, I go for Sludge Bomb, and since he healed, we can now do two more for the KO. That was kinda wild. With bad paralysis luck, that could have ended our run. Following Victory Road and grinding to the Elite Four level cap, filling out our EVs, and picking up some last minute items, we arrive at the Elite Four. Since we're prepared for the Elite Four levels, Barry is no problem at all, although he certainly would be if we weren't prepared with Snorlax and whatnot. The first Elite Four member is Aaron, the bug type trainer. To lead, I choose Wazowski with the Shell Bell as he's got good coverage against his team. Aaron leads with a Yan Mega, which goes for double team right away, but our first four times super effective Rock Slide lands and takes him out in one hit. Scizor then outspeeds and hits us with Nice Slash, but no crit, then four times effective Fire Punch one hit KOs him. Heracross then comes out and also hits us with Night Slash down to a third, and Fire Punch does about the same to him. Now staying in here is risky because of the high critical hit ratio, so I switch into Dante to be safe. This way we can now bait the Mega Horn, which we can switch into Zeppelin for, and it does work, then we can outspeed with Fly to take him down. From here, we can bait the Ice Fang from the Drapion on Zeppelin and switch into Hothina to tank it, then use Never Melt Ice boosted Ice Beams to take him down since he has no Dark Moves. His Vespaquin is then also an easy super effective KO with Ice Beams. That was a really efficient battle, our team was quite synergistic for once. Up next is Bertha, the Ground Type Elite 4 member. According to my calcs, this battle is a bit risky due to some of the KOs being dependent on rolls, but I go with our best option. 
I taught Reaper the Giga Drain TM, so that allows for an easy 4 times effective KO against her lead, Whiskash, especially with the choice specs attached. Now the way this battle goes all depends on her switch in here, and it ends up being Hippowdon. This is one of those rules I was talking about with Giga Drain, but I decide not to risk it and switch into Frostlass who tanks Crunch with below half after Sandstorm, but I know that Ice Beam can KO, and it does. Now in comes Golem, and this is why that Hippowdon switch was so messy. Ice Beam is a roll on Golem now. I'm forced to switch back into Reaper who tanks Fire Bunch reasonably well, and now Giga Drain is a 4 times effective KO. Next she sends in Rhyperior, which is also a 1 hit with Giga Drain. From here, when her Gliscor switches in, it's tempting to switch into Frostlass for the 4 times effective Ice Beam KO, and even though she wouldn't go for Earthquake since Reaper has Levitate, she does have Fire Fang, so I decide to stay in and use Giga Drain and we get hit hard by Thunder Fang. Not wanting to risk a KO, I switch into Phantom on the next one and then use Reflect, then after getting burned by Fire Fang, I go for Confuse Ray, then I switch into Wazowski, and then Dante, whose bulk and power allow us to finish her off. An interesting battle for sure. Up next is the Fire Trainer, Flint. He leads off with a Houndoom, which is again terrifying for us just like Cyrus, but we can perform a similar strategy, getting off three stockpiles, but this one got Sunny Day up in the meantime, which is scary considering his entire team is Fire-type. For this reason, I decide to try and stall it out by using two-turn Fly a couple times on Houndoom instead of Baton Passing, especially since our Citrus Berry activating gave us the Unburdened Speed Boost, which can't be Baton Passed anyway for some reason. We're able to take the Houndoom out with just under half remaining. And now he sends out his Megmortar, which has Thunderbolt, so I Baton Pass into Dante. After a nasty plot and the crazy defense boost, Dante is able to take care of the entire rest of his team, including using Rest with the Chesto Berry to stall out his Flareon's Overheat, since it lowers its special attack every time it uses it, and his Rapidash and Infernape were no match for max power Dark Pulse. Amazing. The final Elite Four member is Lucian, the Psychic-type trainer. On the face of it, this seems like a really easy matchup, but he does have good coverage. First up is his Mr. Mime, and I lead with Spiritomb, so we're not weak to any of his team's moves. I immediately charge up Nasty Plot, knowing the most he can do is Thunderbolt us, and that he'll likely set up Reflect and Light Screen, and he does, so we have to stall those out. Once we're charged up, I use Silverwind to try and get the Omni Boost, and we get the KO, but no boost. Alakazam comes in next, and all it can do is Energy Ball against us, so it's a perfect chance to rest before taking it out. Espeon hits us hard with Shadow Ball, but is an easy KO with Dark Pulse afterwards. Bronzong ended up just using Calm Mind so we can Dark Pulse it into Oblivion, and finally his Gallade hits us down to 20 HP with Stone Edge before being taken down by Dark Pulse. Dante is an absolute legend. The time has come. This is the first time we've ever reached a champion deathless in a monotype hardcore Nuzlocke, except I'm terrified for this battle. I theory crafted for about 45 minutes for this fight, and since she leads with Spiritomb, I realize we have no other option. We have to lead with our own Spiritomb, there's just no other way. To make sure we're in the right damage tier, I use Nasty Plot after getting hit for just under a third. She then hits us to 54 HP and I Nasty Plot again, then she hits us to just 2 HP before we can rest. I knew she was doing a bit less than a third, but that was way closer than I thought. She's outspeeding us also, so she hits us with Dark Pulse, but then our supercharged Dark Pulse is a one-hit KO. In comes Lucario next, something that I'm terrified of, as it has Shadow Ball. Even though Dark Pulse is resisted, it's the best move that I have, and he hits us with Shadow Ball to below half first, and Dark Pulse does about a third. Lucario's next Stone Edge brings us to the red, and we hit it to a third. Now I could potentially switch here, but AI can be weird, and if she goes for Shadow Ball instead of Stone Edge since we're low health, that would be devastating, and Dante can't be sent in to outspeed anything later, so... Rest in peace, sweet prince. Oh wait, her Stone Edge missed! But she survives on what must be like 2 HP. Then she full restores. Absolutely brutal. Dante gets KO'd with only a third damage on it now. Here, I send in Wazowski, the only thing we have with a super effective move against Lucario. She then hits us with Shadow Ball to below half, then Fire Punch hits her hard but just barely doesn't KO again, but our Shell Bell restores us above half. Even though Priority Shadow Sneak is resisted, I thought we'd be able to KO here, but it just barely survives somehow and hits us again down to 20 HP, but we can then outprioritize it again for the KO. Well, at least that thing is dealt with. In comes her Milotic next, another big threat. Wazowski has done his job, so I just go for Shadow Sneak to get some damage off before he goes down. I'm really hoping that was enough damage for the one hit with Phantom's Thunderbolt now, but it survives in the red, then hits us with a mirror coat of all things to take down Phantom immediately. Oof, I kinda forgot about that. 
I really should have used Reflect as I initially planned, but I thought we could KO to be honest and didn't want to take an Ice Beam. Knowing we need our fastest Pokemon for later, I send in Zeppelin here, figuring she'll full restore anyway, and she does. Shadow Ball does about a quarter, and after our second, her Mirror Coat brings us to above half, so I know that we can win this war, and we do with just under half after our Citrus Berry, which has now activated Unburden too. But she sends in Togekiss next, so we can't Shadow Ball. I'm forced to go for Fly here, which does very little, but we survive Shockwave on just 11 HP and can hit it again to below half before getting taken down. Our poor starter. From here, I send in Reaper to take it down with Choice Specs Sludge Bomb. She sends in Roserade next, and I have no choice, so I hit it with Sludge Bomb down to a quarter, then she immediately one-hit KOs us with Extra Sensory. But, my plan seems to have worked. This whole time, I was saying to myself, keep Frostlass alive, as long as possible. And now, we can outspeed and Ice Beam that thing to death. Her final Pokémon is Garchomp, and now, only at the end, does she realize our endgame, as Hathina is able to one-hit KO it with 4 times super effective Ice Beam. We just beat a Pokemon Platinum Hardcore Nuzlocke with only Ghost Types with one Pokemon remaining after going Deathless to the Champion. Ghost Types were incredibly cool to work with, many big challenges, but we started creating some fun team synergy and strategies somewhere around the 5th badge or so. That was a really fun run. If you guys enjoyed this run, please don't forget to hit that subscribe button as it really does help a lot and grows our community. A huge thanks to my YouTube members and patrons who make these videos possible. If you'd like to support and get your name up here, the links are also down below. If you enjoyed, drop a like down below to help the video out and leave a comment letting me know what kind of run we should do next, and I'll see you guys for our next challenge video.